Earlier this week, I brought to you a talk by Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, who served under Francis and Benedict XVI in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Here he is talking about how, well, the development of the papacy, and really what the papacy is, and what it's not. Again, earlier this week, I brought to you a portion of this, a very small portion, where he basically was chastising Francis for appointing people based on ideology and allowing his personal ideological commitments and his personal politics to be a driving force for the papacy. But it was very buried in the talk. He spends a lot of time building up what the papacy is, where it comes from, and what the purpose of it is. And it's an interesting talk, to say the least, especially for maybe those of you who are considering Catholicism, but at the same time, wonder why you would want to join a, the Catholic Church when it's in the state that it's in. Cardinal Mueller here, for all of his other faults, because he does take some rather weird positions on some things, really does hit home with the idea that something has gone deeply wrong with the papacy. And this is odd, coming from the man who himself went after the Dubia Cardinals, Cardinals Kafara, Meisner, Brand, Mueller, and Burke when they issued the Dubia in 2017. Cardinal Burke has, or Cardinal Mueller rather, has since come around, of course, on that topic. But enough from me. Here is Cardinal Mueller on the papacy itself. Anyone who wants to describe the importance of the papacy to the Catholic Church must start with Jesus Christ. Indeed, it is only in the light of the Word made flesh that the mystery of the Holy Church is revealed in its foundation by the historical Jesus of Nazareth. With the founding of the Church as a visible community of people who are related to God in faith, hope, and love in the Holy Spirit, Jesus also called his apostles as his vicars. The bishops, with the presbyters and deacons at their side, preside as successors of the apostles in the place of God of Christ's flock as shepherds in their guidance, as teachers in the proclamation of the gospel, and as priests in sacred worship, i.e. in the celebration of the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist. After his resurrection from the dead and through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and all who are to come to faith, Jesus completed the foundation of the visible church on earth. The Catholic and Apostolic Church is the communion with the triune God and the continuation of the missio of Christ in history. His task is to lead all men to faith in Jesus, the Son of God, and through the seven holy sacraments to the veneration and worship of God. The Church is, in Christ in some way, the sacrament that is the sign and instrument of intimate union with God and of the unity of all mankind, as Vatican II says. The Holy Roman Church has a special role in the communion of the local churches, constituted by the bishops, because it is founded on the testimony of the Word and the martyrdom of the blood of the princes of the apostles Peter and Paul. Its bishop, as the successor of St. Peter, is the perpetual and visible principle and foundation of the unity of faith and communion. With, in, and through Peter, and each of his successors in the see of Peter, the whole church confesses at every moment that Jesus is its divine founder. He is the Word made flesh. We, the disciples of Jesus, are not ourselves the light of the world, but the church confesses that only the Word of God, through whom everything originated, is the light of men, that can illuminate the darkness of the world. With her gaze fixed on Jesus, the church continually makes Peter's confession her own. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon, the man of Galilee, whom the Son of God himself called Peter the Rock, is the person most frequently mentioned in the New Testament after Jesus. He is always named first in the list of the twelve apostles. He is the spokesman of the pre-Easter circle of Jesus' disciples and the highest representative of the apostolic college. When the risen Lord appears to Peter, who in his person represents the whole church, Christ makes him the most important witness of his mission to the Father, and also establishes his central position in the church early Jerusalem. He is the nucleus of the universal, meaning Catholic, and apostolic church, which derives from it in every age and in every world. The continuity of the church in changing times and in the succession of generations derives from the fact that all believers in Christ remain persevering in the teaching of the apostles, and in communion, in the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, and in prayers, meaning the divine liturgy. See Acts chapter 2, verse 42. By teaching of the apostles, we obviously do not mean a philosophical idea or a scientific theory, but rather the preaching and testimony of the apostles, who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and became ministers of the word. See Luke chapter 1, verse 2. The word, the Logos, who is God himself, 
is a divine person, that is, Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Father, who with him and with the Holy Spirit is the one and only God. From his mother Mary, he assumed our human flesh and blood and a human spiritual soul. The teaching of the apostles, which as a profession of faith, is the foundation of the visible and sacramental church, is detailed in Peter's first sermon after the Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and on all those who, starting from this announcement of the word of God, were baptized to be part of the community of the primitive church. In fact, Peter, together with the other 11 apostles, stood up and presented Jesus to the listeners of all the nations, gathered in Jerusalem as the fulfillment of God's entire history of salvation towards Israel and towards all humanity. Know therefore with certainty the whole house of Israel whom God has made Lord in Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. See Acts chapter 2 verse 36. Peter is therefore together with the other apostles, the guarantor and witness of the identity of the historical Jesus until his death on the cross, and of the Christ of faith thanks to that, the paschal event. Consequently, Peter is also the representative of the unity of the pre-Easter circle of disciples and of the post-Easter church, which God brought about on the basis of the Pentecost event. By trade, Simon was a simple fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus did not call the disciples he wanted to make of him apostles, from the circle of the powerful, influential, and wise of the world, but from humble and believing ordinary people. Indeed, no one should have the opportunity to boast of their merits and, therefore, to charm listeners with demagogic rhetoric and propaganda. The apostles must not draw people's attention to themselves. Rather, they must direct the hearers of the preaching to Christ, the true Savior of the world, because Jesus is the only name given to us under heaven, by which we can be saved. Nor was Simon Peter the iron nerved personality who, in his stoic composure, could not be shaken by anything. Jesus often had to rebuke him harshly for his reckless enthusiasm and his defeatist temptations. He even rebuked him as the adversary who hindered Jesus' mission, which was to be accomplished not in the splendor of the golden palaces, but in the shame of the cross on Golgotha. Faced with Jesus' passion, Peter, the apostle of the highest rank, even cowardly denied Jesus three times with the words, I do not know this man. The risen Lord therefore reminded Peter of this denial at the Sea of Tiberias, asking him three times, Do you love me more than these? Because this love for Jesus also brought about his conversion and made evident the depth of communion with Christ as the origin and center of Peter's ministry. This also applies to his successors on the Cathedra Petri in the office of the Bishop of Rome. In Simon's call as the rock on which Jesus builds his church, the mission and authority of the Roman pontiff are also prefigured. The papacy is, in its most intimate essence, a service to the unity of the whole church in the truth of the gospel. Peter's ministry is not a secular office of ruler in the manner of absolutist kings and autocratic czars, but a pastoral spiritual ministry. Bishops and popes must not follow the example of secular rulers who oppress and exploit their people. Rather, they must excel in greater devotion to the eternal salvation of believers. In fact, Jesus said to the apostles who were arguing about which of them should take first place, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, like the Son of Man who did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The title, which probably expresses the essence of the papacy in the deepest way, comes from Pope Gregory the Great, who called himself Servus Savorum Dei, as opposed to the powerful and ostentatious patriarch of the then imperial capital of Constantinople. Unlike the mercenary, the good shepherd is recognized by the fact that, like Jesus, he gives his life for his sheep. In fact, Jesus, true shepherd of the church and of all men, said to Peter three times, Feed my lambs and my sheep. The giving of one's life is also in the inner core of every pastoral ministry in the office of bishop and priest. In the upper room, Jesus entrusts Peter with the perennial task of strengthening his brothers, that is, in their faith in Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord. Jesus' great promise to Peter in the Gospel of Matthew is also found written in the dome of St. Peter's Basilica above the tomb of the apostles. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not prevail over it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. These words of Jesus cannot be relativized by saying that Jesus did not expressly speak of a successor in Rome, or by questioning the historical permanence and martyrdom of the Prince of the Apostles in Rome. It was rather providential that Peter's universal mission was accomplished in his bloody martyrdom in Rome at the time of Nero. Indeed, that other, who will lead Peter where he does not want to go, is the Holy Spirit, who assists him so that he can glorify God through his death. The Catholic Church has always understood that the word of Jesus himself as the foundation of the Roman primacy and as the spiritual foundation of its exercise. A justification of Rome's political status as the capital of a world empire, or the pragmatic consideration that there should be an honorary president among the bishops by virtue of a human right, has always been rigorously rejected.
The office of Peter and his successors and bishops is a truth revealed by God which we accept with supernatural faith. Peter and Paul are the foundation founders of the Church of Rome and that their apostolic teaching and their bloody martyrdom gave that one church the first apostolic foundation. With this church, in fact, by reason of its superior authority, every church must agree that it is the faithful of the whole world since the apostolic tradition has been preserved in it. For the disciples of that time and for the whole church until the end of time, Peter confesses that Jesus is not a prophet or a founder of a religion, but the Christ, the Son of the living God. This judgment does not derive from a purely human logic, but was revealed to Peter and to all believers by Jesus' heavenly Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the same Christ who, before going to the Father, in the saving event of the Ascension, gathered the apostles around him to send them to all humanity in every time and place on earth. The risen Lord approaches the eleven disciples and says to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. As far as the Orthodox churches and Protestant communities are concerned, the primacy of the Pope with the doctrine of infallibility in ex-cathedra decisions and the primacy in universal ecclesial governance, jurisdictional primacy, is often perceived as a stumbling block, an obstacle, since the individual local churches are prevented from following their own paths of faith by adopting to their own culture and raison d'etre. But it is precisely the primacy of the Roman Church which offers the divine guarantee that the Catholic Church remains a universal church and does not disintegrate into autocephalous national churches. A national church with its own creed doubly contradicts the universal unity of all people baptized in Christ. In the first place, nations, peoples, cultures, and languages produce neither subjects nor passive membranes capable of translating a divine background noise into human melody pleasing to the contemporaries. Second, the Word of God unites believers in the Pentecostal spirit of the Father and of the Son across cultural differences into one church. Against the fundamental falsification of the Christian mysteries of the unity and trinity of God, and of the incarnation of the sacramentality of the Church and of the corporeality of the redemption, at the end of the second century, Irenaeus of Lyons, Lyons <laughs> emphasized against the Gnostics of his time and of all time, the unit, unitas, and the communion of the universal Church on the basis of the apostolic tradition. Quoting St. Irenaeus, In reality, the Church, although spread throughout the world to the ends of the earth, having received the faith from the apostles and their disciples, preserves this preaching and this faith with care, and as if she lived in a single house, there believes in the same identical way as if he had only one soul and one heart, and he preaches the truths of the faith, teaches them, and transmits them with a unanimous voice as if he had only one mouth. In fact, the languages in the world are varied, but the content of the tradition is unique and identical, and neither the churches that are in Germany, nor those that are in Spain, nor those that are among the Celts, nor those of the east, of Egypt or Libya, nor those who are at the center of the world. The bishop of Rome, therefore, also represents in his person the diachronic and synchron synchronic unity of the church in the succession of the apostles and in the internal continuity of the church with its origin in Christ and in the apostles. Since only the bishop of Rome is the personal successor of Peter, while the other bishops are successors of the apostles throughout their college, the prerogatives of Simon in his capacity as Peter, as the rock on which Christ, the son of the living God, will build his church, are also valid for the bishop of Rome. Over time, the title of Pope has evolved to include a single term, the essential elements of the Petrine ministry of the Roman bishop. But there, are, there remains crucial differences between apostles and bishops. The apostles with Peter at the head were the direct recipients and bearers of God's full self-revelation in Christ. The bishops and the Pope, on the other hand, are linked in content to realization of revelation in sacred scripture and in the apostolic tradition. The office of authentically interpreting the word of God, whether written or transmitted, is entrusted to the sole living magisterium of the church, whose authority is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. Which magisterium, however, is not superior to the word of God, but serves it, teaching only what has been handed down, inasmuch as, by divine mandate and with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, it piously listens, holy guards, and faithfully expounds that word. Even if the doctrinal decisions of the church in particular cases infallibly reflect revelation because they are supported by the charism of the Holy Spirit, nevertheless they require the best possible human preparation and demand to be jealously preserved and faithfully exposed, and both the Pope and the bishops are obliged to do so in consciousness. Even for the general governance of the church, the Pope should first entrust himself to the College of Cardinals, which after all represents the Holy Roman Church and, like the Presbytery advises a bishop, advises the Pope collegially, synodally.
As in all cases, a consultative body constituted by the supreme decision maker, according to criteria of complacency and clientelism, is of little use and does more harm than good to those in charge. The latter does not need the praises that flatter human vanity. Looking at the human weaknesses that can afflict us in imminent ways, as already in the case of Simon Peter, Joseph Ratzinger also spoke in terms of the history of the church, of the fact that even the popes can become a scandal because, as human beings, they believe they want to blaze a trail that is populist to public taste but contradicts the spirit of Christ. Every pope must distinguish precisely between his divine mandate and himself as an individual with all his limitations. He must not impose his private opinions on politics or economics and non-theological sciences on other Christians. Nor may a pope or bishop or other ecclesiastical superior abuse the trust which is readily placed in him in a fraternal atmosphere to furnish incompetent or corrupt friends with ecclesiastical sinecures, or, contrary to divine right, arbitrarily depose bishops to him, personally unwelcome, or to interfere without just cause in the ordinary pastoral office of the diocesan bishop. If there was a traitor among the apostles chosen by Jesus, and even Peter denied Jesus during the Passion, then we all know that even the human representatives of the church in history and in the present can fail and abuse their office in a selfish or narrow way. We also have an example of this in the matters of the faith, given that Paul openly resisted Peter when he allowed himself a dangerous ambiguity in the truth of the gospel. Our effective and effective detachment to the Pope and our bishop or pastor has nothing to do with the unworthy personality cult of secular autocrats, but it's brotherly love for a fellow Christian who has been entrusted with the highest responsibility in the church. He can also fail in this. That is why loving admonition pr promotes the church more than slavish hypocrisy. But the best way to help the Pope and the bishops is through prayer. We trust in Jesus, the Lord of the church, who before his passion said to Simon, the rock on which he would build his church, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has taught you to, has sought you to sift like wheat, but I have prayed for you that you may, your faith may not fail. And you once converted strengthen your brothers. Peter's faith is the faith of the whole church that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I'm curious if you, what you think of his statement here that the papacy should be above and beyond politics itself. Yes, politics, of course, matters for the church. It, it will always matter for the church. But that the papacy cannot be bound to the ideological commitments of a particular pontiff, that a pontiff should put aside his own politics for the good of the church. Of course, on paper, that sounds good, but is that even possible? I'm sure there are numerous things from history you could give as examples of this. Famously, Pius XI and Pius XII in, in, during the run-up to and in World War II had positive things to say about the, uh, we'll say, head of state of Italy at the time. Pius XII going so far as to say that he could tell you that the man is in heaven. That might come as a shock to you, <laughs> but he said that. And one wonders if that is just his ideological commitments kind of bleeding through, or if there's something else. You could come up with numerous examples, though, of the ideological commitments of a pope being front and center. So I'm curious if you think Mueller is right, or if this is just sort of a naive thing. So let me know in the comments. And also, did you learn anything from his talk here about the papacy? Very curious if you did. I should have this uploaded, the text of this, available Linked in my show notes today at return to tradition.org. You will need a, some sort of web translation extension for that, though, to be able to read it. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot, too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.